Kelly Eric so you can share your screen. So without further ado, we would like to uh, give our undivided attention to our speaker this morning, Elder Eric Mahinay. So praise the Lord, Pastor Paolo. It's my honor uh, to be a part of your group, uh, Tinian Virtual Worship. It's truly a blessing if we are together, right? In, yes. in Central Church and Kagman, because in Saipan, we have three groups, Tinian, oh no, uh, Kagman, San Antonio, and Central Church. Mm. You know, it's somewhat big, but it's good to have a small, a small group. And in fact, how many years ago, we formed a small group here in Saipan. So that group are growing. So, um, but because of this COVID virus, actually, we, we are a little bit slowing down a little bit. So praise the Lord. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Uh, we Sorry. keep the Sabbath because God owns us twice by creation and by redemption. That's why we... By keeping the Sabbath, we recognize Him as our God, our Savior, our friend, and our Creator. Shall Amen. we pray for us before we proceed? Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we humbly come before the throne of grace. Your people come before the throne of grace. Sensing our nothingness, Lord, we humbly come before the throne of grace. We ask your guidance, the Holy Spirit, to open our eyes and our hearts and guide us as we dig a little bit upon your word, that we may learn something that will bring us more closer to Jesus. Especially, Lord, in this time of crisis, we need encouragement and we need comfort. And we need also, Lord, to be properly guided by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer in Jesus' loving name. Amen. Amen. So let's proceed to our topic. My simple topic this morning is all about how big is our God? You know, God is really, really big. Uh, we, with our limited understanding, we cannot, as human beings, we cannot actually uh, understand fully the nature and the character of God. Mm. All we know is that God is omnipotent, all power. God is omniscient. He's present everywhere. And omniscient, I know Omniscient means he knows everything, and omnipresent means he is everywhere. And one, number four, uh, manifestation or power of God or nature of God is that God is the I am. He exists by himself. He has no beginning. Okay, so with our limited understanding, right, we can understand the nature of God if we go back to the Bible, if we go to nature, and most of all, if we can study, we learn the life and ministry of Jesus on earth. Now, let's proceed. I think I shared this a few years ago when I was there in Tinian. December 26, 2004, when the seabed of Sumatra, Indonesia, was shook by a very strong earthquake. That's 9.1 to 9.3 magnitude earthquake that caused tsunami. And then there were 50,000 people who were affected by that tsunami, who died because of the tsunami. Approximately 50,000 people that very day died because of that great tsunami. And that great tsunami, according to the annals of history, became the worst tragedy and tsunami took place in Asia, according to history. A lot of homes, business establishments were damaged because of that tsunami. Okay, so the major countries that are affected by the tsunami was Burma, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India, Thailand. Okay, so 50,000 people. Why the tsunami is very meaningful to me? Because during the tsunami, me and Pastor Galen, I don't know if Pastor Paolo still remember, we yes. went to Tinian because there was an evangelistic meeting in Tinian. We mm. planned for the evangelistic meeting. So me and Pastor uh, Galen, we went there by that ship, that boat, right? Do you, do you remember that? Yes. The shuttle from Saipan yes. to Tinian and Tinian to Saipan. Wow, that was the, the boat was swaying because of the turbulent 
waves the time waves maybe 20 12 footer right so the turbulence wave uh swing made the shuttle swaying so in way back in bangladesh in thailand in burma in india 50000 people died i would like to show you the pictures of the the aftermath of the the tsunami this is one of them i would like to i don't want to share everything because it's really devastating scary and much discouraging but behind the devastating tsunami there is a story or there was a story that caught the attention to our media throughout the world the international media this group of people here the mokens mokens are people who live in the coastal area of burma and thailand they were the sea gypsies most of them they are born they are raised they work on the water most of them they dive died on the water they stayed on the water for years years that water is their best friend in fact the mokens knows the sound the movements of the water the water than the those scientists or science or people who study about water okay they know better they know better so i would like to show you the picture of the mokens here these are the mokens look at them the water is their best friend they know the movement and the sound of the water okay so the the amazing thing is that nobody died among the mokens nobody died because why the water was their best friend they know the sound they know the sign they know the movement of the water nobody died amen because they the water gave warning first before the tsunami came there was a warning they learned about those warnings the signs and they went to a higher ground and some of them were in the water they went to a shallow water because if it's if you are in the shallow you will not be really affected by the tsunami now one of them is no other than sally kalathale sally kalathale love people he cared about the welfare and you know the welfare of people in the community so before the tsunami came when the water receded and sally kalathale saw it in his naked eyes he knew that it was a warning of the upcoming uh tsunami calamity so he went around he warned his loved ones people in the tribe and he went to the community and warned them about the upcoming tragedy and the upcoming tsunami and people a lot of people take heed of his warning and you know friends a lot of people were saved because of sally kalat hale and sally kalat hale after the tsunami he became a local uh, hero in their community in his community he became a local hero amen so we are also facing a crisis right now if those countries facing a crisis because of the tsunami because of the earthquake friends we are also facing a uh, a crisis right now we have this covid virus all of us are affected even though there is no single case in pinyan but still you are affected in the sense that nobody can fly right it's very challenging your part as well evan rota but you know brothers and sisters in christ in the midst of this crisis we must be like sally kalethale we must go out and save people out there we must share to them the gospel that gives comfort and encouragement the gospel all about jesus especially titus chapter 2 verse 13 we must share the blessed hope that jesus is coming soon that in the midst of this crisis that people are facing right now people will be warned people will accept that hope and people will have that, that hope in their lives and they will be ready for the soon coming of jesus amen so let's amen. proceed let's go to ellen white's writing maranatha page 161 it says here confusion fills the world in a great terror is soon to come upon human beings if we know the the events that will take place after this 
The end is very, very near. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 6, the Bible says, chapter 10, verse 6, we are now in the end of time. There will be time no longer, according to Revelation chapter 10, verse 6. God's people should be preparing for what is to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. It will be a surprise to those people who are in darkness, but it will not be a surprise for each and everyone because we know the signs, right? We have the Bible. We have the spirit of prophecy that tell us what will happen in the near future. In fact, after this uh, calamity or after this crisis, I believe that there will be more uh, there will be a short period of peace, and later on, it will be followed by a little time of trouble, okay? Yes. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and a loud cry, and a sun below. We, we know that, but we will learn more about it in the near future, because I believe that you guys, you have your study every night. You are studying about the sign of the times. Ellen White says here, Ellen White says, then we shall look at the iniquity around us and drill upon the dark side. We must not drill upon the dark side, right? We must not drill upon the negative side, but we must drill in the positive side. You cannot cure it. Yes, we cannot do anything about it. Talk of something that is higher, better, and more noble. Talk of those things that will leave a good impression on the mind. And it will lift every soul up out of this iniquity into light beyond. What is that again? We must not dwell in the negative side, friends, beloved brothers and sisters. We must dwell in the positive side, not in the dark side, but in the bright side. We cannot do anything about this crisis. Our part is just to prepare people for the soon coming of Jesus, encourage them, comfort them, and let's continue to read. Ellen White continues to say, Tell the suffering ones of the compassionate Savior. He looks with compassion upon those who regard their case as hopeless. People right now are hopeless. We must introduce Jesus Christ to them. While the soul is filled with fear and terror, the mind cannot see the tender compassion of Christ if you can inspire the despondent with a hopeful, saving faith, contentment, and cheerfulness will take the place of discouragement and unrest. That's our part, friends. We have a lot of opportunities to do that because of this uh, quarantine, isn't it? We don't have work. I don't work full time. So we have time to visit people, to encourage and comfort them. So we must not focus on the dark side. Do not focus on the virus. Yes, because it's very discouraging. We must focus on who? We must focus upon Jesus Christ. Focus unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. By the way, it says here, I would like to include this. What should we learn from this pandemic? What, what should we learn? In your personal experience, for in the, in the past few months, what I learned is that I have to focus on the positive side. Right? I have to focus on the bright side, not on the dark side or negative side. So how can you focus on the positive side? Instead of focusing how many cases throughout the world, I focus on those people who recovered from virus. So it is updated. Just this morning, I updated this. So the, throughout the world, there are 3,907, 497. It might be changed. There might be changes because it was a few hours ago. So these are the numbers of those people who recovered. In United States of America, there are 837, 245 people recovered. In Philippines, there are 5,454 people recovered. Why I focus on this, you know, the recovery side, not the cases, because the cases discourage us. But if you think about recovery, those recovered in the world, in United States and Philippines, friends, it gives us comfort, it gives us encouragement, it gives us hope that one day God in his own time, in his own timetable, in his own timetable will eventually stop this virus. Amen? Yeah. So we must focus on the positive side. 
Before I focus on the cases, how many cases, but now I don't focus on the cases anymore. I focus, uh, I focus on the recovery side because it gives me comfort, encouragement, and strengthen my faith that God will do something in the near future. I'm so sorry because I have problems sometimes with my projection. So, so Ellen White says, it is not work that kills, it is worry. The only way to avoid worry is to take every trouble to Christ. Let us not look on the dark side. Let us cultivate the cheerfulness of spirit. She says that who kills us is not work. It is worry because of this virus, isn't it? Right? In order for us not to worry, do not focus on the negative side or the dark side, but we have to bring everything to to Jesus. Now let's continue to read. It says here, when stress, anxiety, worry, overwhelm, depression, isolation are left unchecked, they actually reduce the effectiveness of our immune system and make you and those around you much susceptible to getting sick. Oh, somebody projected something. Oh, that's, uh, were you sharing your screen, Brother Allen? Yeah, I think somebody shared the text for the screen. Uh, can we close the screen? All right. Are you, yes, we can see only your screen. I don't see any other, see, I don't see any other projection. Yes, yeah, so when stress, anxiety, worry, overwhelm, depression, and isolation are left unchecked, they actually reduce the effectiveness of your immune system and make you and those around you much susceptible to getting sick. Mm. And what else? It says here, your immune system is challenged you are more likely to contract a spread of circulating circulating virus and expose those around you your communities and the global population if you are worried amen so this is from Ellen actually Duggerty she is a doctor of health and she was invited to speak in one of the seminaries in United States of America now number two Spend quality time with your family and friends. So number one, right, we must be positive. Number two, spend quality time with your family and friends. I would like to share something that, you know, in this uh, crisis, me and my family, we spent a lot of time. We played basketball, we swam, we climbed uh, hills, we jogged, we ran. So... This is the right time for us to spend quality time with our family and our mm -hmm. friends. Perhaps there is a, this, a social distancing, but you can talk to them through cell phone, messenger, talk to them through Zoom. There's a lot of means and ways to communicate our friends, our loved ones, our families, you know, to spend quality time with them. We must spend quality time with them. Number three, spend quality time with God. With this virus, with this crisis, well, friends, we have a lot of time to be spent with God. Number one, Bible study and spirit of prophecy. We have a lot of time to read the Bible and to read the spirit of prophecy. What else? Time to pray, right? So Bible study, spirit of prophecy, and time to pray. Number three, family worship. Morning and evening worship. I would like to encourage you. Maybe you did not have worship in your family before. Make it a habit. Give it to God. Ask God, Lord, please. We would like to commit our time to you as family. We would like to commit our morning time and evening time, Lord, to focus on you. To wait on you. To have family worship. Family worship is very essential to every family because we, this is where uh, the family grow as a group, as a group, as a church, because family is also a church. Number four, worship with church family. So Bible study and study the spirit of prophecy, prayer, 
family worship and worship with church family. We have this Zoom vir virtual worship. I mean, so there's a lot of ways for us to grow, to spend quality time with God, quality time with your family, quality time with one another through worship. Okay? So hopefully, we can make a decision. We, commit, we can commit our time, precious time, quality time with God. Okay, so the other one is witnessing. The fifth one is witnessing. I was able to visit this beloved brother. This is Brother Ray Babauta, one of our Bible study students inside the correction facility. Actually, mm -hmm. I asked permission from him to project his picture here. We have constant communication. This guy actually is sick. We have a lot of Bible studies in prison right now. There are some also got baptized. This guy was supposed to be baptized as well. But he is very, very sick. He was referred to Philippines and in Guam. So uh, we visited a lot of people. We have Sister Naimi, Sister Linda, sick as well. They, were all, they are also sick. We visited them. So the time of crisis is an opportunity for us to do witnessing. Amen? To do witnessing. So Bible study, prayer, spend quality time with God, and yeah, through worship with the family, and we have this witnessing. Number four, look unto God for victory and deliverance for our God is a what? Big God. This is my topic this morning. So look unto God. This is the right time for us, friends, to focus on God and ask God for victory and for guidance. Okay, because our God is big. I would like to share a verse from the Bible, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. Okay? The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, let's go back to our main topic. How big is our God? Our God is too big. Right? If you look at the universe... How many billions of universe in a multiverse? And how many multiverse in the space? From Aristotle to Plato to Isaac Newton to Albert Einstein and to Galileo, no one among them can explain the vastness of the universe. There is a Hubble right now. There is a Hubble law that tells us that this universe, the universe that we are belong, is expanding. We call it expanding universe. And it is also supported by Albert Einstein in his theory of relativity. But actually, nobody from the old scholars to our uh, time, the scientists, nobody can explain, can give us the information about how vast is the space, how vast is the universe, and the multiverses. Now, this is the universe. A lot of universes in a multiverse. And how many galaxies in a universe? In a universe, there are two, 400 to 2 trillion 200 billion and 2 trillion galaxies in a universe. It's too huge. And how many multiverses in the space? You can count. Okay? That's why our God is really, really big. Our God is really big. We know that, right? God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. And the Bible says here, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God has no beginning. When God told Moses, he said, Moses actually, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, Moses asked of God, he said, Lord, if this people, the Israelite, ask me what is your name, what should I say? Moses said, tell them, I am who I am. It is I am who sent you to them. What do you mean by I am in the Bible? I am means self-existent one. Amen. The person that has no beginning and has no end. From the Hebrew word, the tetragrammaton. Look at that. Why it's W-H. Amen. So I am means a person that has no beginning. God has no beginning. How about in the New Testament? Who is the I am in the New Testament? 
in John chapter 5, verse 58, or chapter 8, verse 50, 58, Jesus Christ said to those uh, religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Jews, Jesus Christ said, before Abraham was, I am. So when those scholars hear, the scholars actually scrutinize Jesus, when they hear what Jesus Christ said, that I am, before Abraham was I am, they pick some stone and they are about to stone Jesus. Because Jesus claimed that word from the Old Testament. He claimed that he is the Jehovah, he is the Yahweh. And in John chapter 10 verse 30, Jesus Christ claimed as well, he claimed the equality, his equality with the Father, when Jesus Christ said, I and the Father are one. And the Jews pick some stones again and to stone Jesus. And Jesus asked them, why do you stone me? Do you stone me because of my good works? They said, no, we don't stone you because of your good works. We stone you because you are just a mere man that claim to be God. Mm. The good news, beloved brothers and sisters, is that the Savior who died on the cross to save us, whom we accepted as our personal Savior, Jesus Christ, he is also the I am. Amen? And we have, it gives us an assurance that when he comes for the second time, friends, the same I am, and for eternity, the same I am. Friends, when we are standing before the throne of God, it, there is an assurance because he is our mediator, and also at the same time, he is our judge. Now let's proceed, Isaiah 44, 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things. How many things? Oh. All things, including the universe, multiverse, and the space that stretches forth the heavens alone, uh, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Our great and most powerful and sovereign God claims that he formed everything. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Who is this person here? This person is no other than Paul. I mean, 14 years ago, he was converted. He was changed. He was completely changed. He was clothed by the righteousness of Jesus. And in this verse, he experienced, he claimed that he experienced to be lifted up on high and he saw heaven, the third heaven. How big is God? Scientists don't talk about third heaven. They just talk about heaven and the universe. But look at the Bible. The Bible talks about heaven, third heaven. And this third heaven is heaven farther away. It's like a little bit far from the universe and the multiverse. I don't know where is this third heaven. And heaven, Albert Einstein perhaps, or uh, Galileo, don't even mention this third heaven. That's how big is our God, beloved. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows because he was lifted up. He saw heaven in his vision 14 years ago during his conversion. Now let's go to Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of who? By the word of God. What is seen is not made out of what is that which is visible. Amen. So by faith, our response to God's greatness and sovereignty and power and size of God is no other than faith. Now, a lot of people throughout the world right now, when they read about the story of Jonah, they read Jonah, they focus on the big, big fish, right? Their focus is the big fish instead of the big God. Sometimes we are like that in our human nature. We focus on the negative side. People try to scrutinize what the Bible says. But friends, do not focus as Christians. We know the principle of the Bible. We have faith on God. Do not focus or argue about that big fish. How big is the fish? Our focus must be the size of our God. That our God is big. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And praise the Lord. How big is your faith? Because your faith determines 
the size of your God. If your faith is small, therefore God is small. If your faith is big, therefore the size of your God is big. We must ask ourselves, how big is my faith in God? Because my faith determines the size of my God. Your faith determines the size of our, your God. How big is God? Now, this is the last part here. I would like to share a story here about this big guy here, the so-called giant, Goliath, and David. Okay? So this is like, um, there's no match with this uh, battle. David and Goliath. Okay? We know this story, right? Uh, children learn this story, heard this story in the Sabbath school. There are uh, some of us, I'm not uh, born Seventh-day Adventist. I learned this story when I was already like an adult. But this is a very popular story, David and Goliath. I don't want to give you the details about this story, but I would like to give you the, the lessons that I learned from this story. Now, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, where belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and they still stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them can you imagine this this is like a war and this like a, there's like a valley between them now remember this when Israel are facing a battle Israel was not that battle was not just a political battle or a physical battle it is a spiritual battle multiple because God was always with them if they listen to the voice of God. Sometimes they went to battle without God. So that's why we need to learn something from this. And a champion, that's Goliath, went out from the camp of the Philistine named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So six cubit, if you convert this to our the uh, modern conversion right now, Goliath, maybe allow around 9 to 10 feet. But it, I'm wrong actually because Ellen White says it's not just 9 to 10 feet, but Ellen White says it's just like about 12 feet. Can you imagine that? It's awesome, isn't it? Who is, a, there's the person in the world right now whose height is 11 feet or like almost 12 feet. Now, he had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. Okay? And he had bronze armor in his legs and a bronze javelin uh, between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. And a shell bearer went before him. Then he stood and carried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and the servant of Saul? And you are the servant of Saul. Choose a man for yourselves and let him come to me, down to me for battle. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then he will be your servant. I would like to, I don't want to focus more on those verses, but let's go back to Goliath. Goliath was about 12 foot tall. The weight of his coat is like about 125 pounds. The coat alone is like 125 pounds. Can you imagine how heavy is the coat? His spear said 15 pounds, and this person here is not trained for battle since he was, a, he was young. He was just not just tall, but he was also huge in size. Amen? So he was equipped for battle. I mean, actually, Goliath is not from Philistines. If you read uh, the history about this a little bit, he was in the place of the giants. Perhaps the Philistines hired him for battle. Or maybe he married one of the officers of Philistines. That's why he became a Philistine citizen. Right? So let's proceed. 
How about his opponent? This is the opponent here, and he's very popular. My son's name is uh, also the same name as this guy here. This guy is no other than David. David is, was just a youth. He was a shepherd, and the only thing that he brought for battle was his sling and five stones. But the good news is, he was with him. That Goliath did not have. God was with him. Amen. Why he won the battle? Because he was thinking that the battle is not his own battle. The battle is the Lord's. Amen. It was God who equipped, who strengthened, and made David a victorious one. According to Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 644, uh, paragraph 1 says, God was teaching David lessons of trust. As Moses was trained for his work, so the Lord was fitting the son of Jesse to become the guide of his chosen people. In his watch care for his flocks, he was gaining an appreciation of the care that the great shepherd has for the sheep of his pasture. But the Philistines, look at this, propose their own manner of warfare in selecting a man of great size, strength, whose height is about 12 feet. This is what I mentioned earlier. About 12 feet. And they sent this champion forth to provoke a combat with Israel, requesting them to send out a man to fight with him. He was a terrible in appearance. Horrible, terrible. And spoke proudly and defied the armies of Israel and their God. Mm. So what should I learn? I, what, what did I learn from this story here? Just wait, because uh, I have a problem with projecting. Okay, then. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Hmm. Let's go a little bit here. So the first lesson that I learned from this story is that God is stronger and bigger than who? Goliath. Amen? Maybe you are facing a Goliath right now in your life. Maybe the Goliath that you are facing is finances. Maybe the Goliath that you are facing is health. Just like me. I'm a little bit sick too. Maybe you are facing a, a crisis like coronavirus in Philippines. Maybe you are in Philippines and you are locked down. You are isolated. You are facing a, a crisis. Friends, the good news is that God is bigger than the crisis that you are facing right now. God is bigger than the problem or the challenges that you are facing right now. Amen? If David won the battle because God was with him, God was bigger than Goliath, friends, you will win the battle as well because God is with you, God is with us, and our God is bigger than our problem. Great is our God, our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground, Goliath. He casts Goliath to the ground, but he lifts up the humble. So we must submit our will, our plan to God, and God will lift, up, lift, lift, us, up, lift us up. Okay? Great is our God. Our part is just to believe and trust in God. Number two. Number two reason that I would like to share. Fight the battle not your own way, but God's way. How often we fight our battle, our problems, the trials by our own way. Right? Remember in Revelation chapter 3 verse uh, 18 or 17 that the Laodicea think that they are rich. They don't need anything. We are all Laodiceans. We are trying to be independent, self-sufficient. That's why God said, but I tell you, you are blind. You are wretched. Friends, we must not fight our own battle. We must bring that battle to God so that battle that you are facing right now is not yours anymore. That battle is God's battle. Bring it to God. And do not fight the battle with your own way. Fight the battle with your 
uh, with God's way. Remember the, the, the battle with uh, David and Goliath? Uh, Saul was trying to put something on David, right? But David said, no, I'm so small with those, right? So David fought the battle in a very simple way. And that battle, uh, he fought the battle in God's way. The Bible says that do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God himself will fight for, for you. So the Lord will fight for you. If you're facing a battle right now, bring it to God. And God will fight for you. Your battle will become God's battle. It's no longer yours. Number three. The third le lesson that I learned. God has a stone. God has always a stone to every Goliath. Isn't it wonderful? That God has a solution to every problem that we are facing. Right? If your problem is finances, God will pour out, God will one day pour out so much blessings upon you if you just rely in His power and claim His promises. God has always a stone to every Goliath, friends. He has always a solution to all our trials and problems and challenges that we are facing. He has a stone for this crisis. He has a stone for this pandemic and this coronavirus. Let us just wait and see and behold the, the power of God in the near future. He will stop this coronavirus. And the Bible promise or the promises from the Bible says, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. How can we get that promise? How can we get that stone, the solution of our problem? The Bible says, call upon me. Call upon me in prayer. Call upon me in reading the Bible, in spending time with the Bible. Call upon me with your fellowship with one another as a family of God, as a household of God. Call upon me in your witnessing. Amen. I will show thee and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things with thou, which thou knowest not. And this is the last one, actually. The last one is powerful. The battle is the Lord's. It's no longer your battle, friends. It's no longer my battle. It's the Lord's battle. Remember, I mentioned earlier that every battle that the Israelites face is not just a political battle, or a physical battle, but it's the Lord's battle as well. A spiritual battle. So the battle is the Lord, according to David. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and He will give all of you into our hands. David did not say, into my hand, but into our hands. The battle is who? Is the Lord's. Our, the battle that we are facing right now, this crisis, is not our battle. This is the battle of the Lord. Amen. Our only part is just to trust in God. God allows this crisis to happen in order for people throughout the world right now will be um, warned will be informed that there is God, the Creator, because there is too much evil. There is too much darkness in the world right now. Too much wickedness. Amen? Amen. And in our part as Christians, God allows this battle to happen because for us to grow, to, for us to trust in God fully, to trust in His power and His leading, not to be discouraged, but to remain faithful and trust in His leading and His power. To close my message this morning, I would like to share again about that tsunami way back in December 26, 2004. There was something that caught the attention of the international media at the time. This lady here, this lady, instead of going away, running away from the waves, the turbulent waves, to look for a higher ground, what did she do? She ran, she was facing the, the turbulent wave. Because why? Because of those people in front of him. His three kids. His husband. And he, oh no, her husband. And her 
brother. She did not mind about the, the waves, but she was thinking how to save his loved ones, okay? It was attracted, uh, the international media was attracted to this. Was she insane? What, she, what did she do? So actually, later on, they found out that this lady is from Sweden. His name is Karen Vard. It was, she was 37 years old when the tsunami took place, and she was a police officer in Sweden. Uh, in her local community, she was a police officer. She ran toward the waves, the turbulent waves, because to save her children. And then later on, the international media and the local media found her in her home and interviewed her. I tell you, friends, that's why, you know, mothers, I appreciate mothers, all of you mothers, I appreciate you because of your love toward your children. It is not Mother's Day, but I would like to greet you again. A happy, happy Mother's Day because of the love that you have shown to your children. Amen. Even though your children are hard-headed and stiff-necked, you still love them, train them, and supply their needs. So, happy Mother's Day. She was interviewed by the local media, and she responded. She said, I had to try to save my children. Nothing was going to stop me, even the turbulent waves. Terror was coming up inside me. I could feel it, but I was so focused. I just started running to my family. She told the Express newspaper in Sweden, I could see this white wall or the waves coming to me, and it was coming faster. I did not care. I was looking at my children. I wanted to hold them and care for them. Isn't it wonderful, friends? The love of a mother, the love of a wife, the love of a sister. This mother actually reminds us about who? About this person here, Jesus Christ. Karen Vard can save his children and his husband and the sister and the brother, you know, maybe in some other way he can save, she can save them. But Karen, uh, Karen cannot forgive them. Amen. But our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he can forgive us from all our sins. In 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? This is far greater than the love of Karen that she showed to her children, husband and brother, Jesus Christ, friends, love us more than Karen. This is the right time for us to approach this throne of grace with humility and with a contrite heart and accept him as our personal Savior right now and say, Lord, I am yours. Amen? knowing that there is no sin that he cannot forgive, according to 1 John 9, if we just confess, he's willing to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's not just cleansing us from our sins, but he will give us power to overcome our sins through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now he's inviting us right now. He's telling us to come to him. Friends, this is an opportunity for us to come to him. Amen? Amen. This is an opportunity to come. I don't know about your answer, about your response to God's calling. Shall we pray to close my message? Father in heaven, Lord, yes, we want, you, we want to come to you right now. I know that you are still knocking at the door of our hearts. Lord, we are willing to open our hearts to allow you to enter and loving Father so that we can experience your presence we can experience your goodness in our lives. Loving Father, I pray that you may bless each and every one right now. I pray the leadership and the family and Pastor Paolo himself, I pray for them as a family that you may supply all their needs, give them good health and strength. Strengthen their faith, Lord. Heal their sickness. Bind them with one cord of love and faith. I believe right now, Lord, that you are using Pastor Pablo, Paolo in a very special way. I pray that there will be more people out there 
who will be saved because of him and the rest of the members of the family. Our beloved brothers and sisters, Lord, who are listening right now at Zoom, and Lord, if, if there are circumstances that he cannot join us, they cannot join us, Lord, I pray for all of them as well. Lord, bless each and every one. Save them, Lord. Strengthen their faith, their commitment to serve and to follow you. Help them to trust in you fully and supply all their needs and heal their sickness. And them as a church, Lord, bind them with one cord of love and faith. Guide us, loving Father, as we continue to keep the remaining uh, hours of the Sabbath. Help us, Lord, to be a blessing to those people around us. And look at this crisis in the positive side, not in the dark side. In, Je in Jesus' loving name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord.